proud to be the new UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Freedom of Expression and the Safety of Journalists. And I want to address all of you today for World Press Freedom Day from my studio here, where I am fortunate enough to be able to, every night, report freely and hold world leaders and others to account and also to shine lights on those corners where people have no voices and no one to tell their stories. I'm the fortunate one. And until we can do that for all of our colleagues, until all journalists can report and work freely and without hindrance, we have a lot of work to do. So on this World Press Freedom Day, I think we should all take stock and realize that yes, we have to lobby for journalists' safety, physical safety in the field, but we also have to lobby for when journalists get wounded, get imprisoned, get tortured, when journalists are shut down one way or another. We must make sure that either governments or non-government actors that do this to journalists are held accountable. That this climate of impunity has to stop. In so many countries, in so many parts of the world, journalists simply cannot work free. There is this desire in too many parts of the world to literally kill the messenger. And we are here to report the truth. We are here to support civil society, to enable better governance, and really to make our world a much, much better place. And it can be done. Journalists do not have to be the enemy. Journalists must not be forced into political corners. Journalism is not politics. It is simply the act of speaking the truth. So on this World Press Freedom Day, again, I'm proud to be UNESCO's new goodwill ambassador on this issue, and I pledge to fight hard to keep up the struggle and to fight for this cause. So it's Latvia's turn to take over the presidency of the Council of the European Union. What should you know about the country that's going to lead its 27 sisters for the next six months? Let's start with something a true leader needs, honesty. So here it is, your next leader is flat in the landscape, quiet in temper, cold in temperature, and small in size. Small is not a bad thing. It means that we are used to looking at things more closely. We polish, we angle, we untangle, and we fine-tune until everything is just right. We pay attention to detail, and as we all know, the devil is in the detail. Honestly, our winters are cold. For six months of the year, it is actually snowing here. However, winter has taught us to think ahead and to be prepared for both easy times and hard ones. It's called planning. To be honest, almost everything is flat in Latvia. We don't have the highest waterfall, but we do have a really, really wide one. So we look far, we look wide, and we don't like our vision to be hampered by anything closer than the horizon. Also, our landscape gives us plenty of room for imagination, which leads to creativity, which in turn leads to arts and innovation. It's true, we didn't invent the internet, but we do have one of the fastest internet speeds in the world, and we need it to spread the word about our culture, from one of the greatest collections of Art Nouveau architecture in Riga, to the largest choir festival in the world, to modern art, to world famous opera singers and ballet dancers. Without making much noise, we've given the world some of its finest classical musicians. 
and we say almost nothing about our food, but it's just because we've learned that it's not polite to speak with a full mouth. Our food is to be enjoyed, not to be discussed. To be honest, about 50% of Latvia is not covered in forests, which means that the other 50% is. That's why Latvians are a bit closer to nature than the average European finds normal. We drill birch trees for sap, we pick all kinds of mushrooms and eat them. We shock our immune systems by jumping from hot saunas into ice-cold lakes and back again. The truth is we don't always smile, but when we do, it comes from the heart. Latvians are kind of like coconuts, we may be kind of hard on the outside, but when you crack the shell, you'll find a truly friendly soul. Pleased to meet you, honestly. Director General of UNESCO, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Baiba Braže, I'm Director General here at the Latvian Foreign Ministry, and I'm also Chair of the Steering Committee of the Preparation of World Press Freedom Day. On behalf of the Steering Committee and the Government of Latvia, I am delighted to welcome you to Riga, Latvia, and to the UNESCO World Press Freedom Day 2015. Latvia offered to host it to celebrate the freedoms that we so cherish. The freedom of expression, the freedom of speech, the freedom of media, and journalists as a profession. It is understandable as Latvia, having been a country that had been denied this right, cherish it so much. And truly, it is a global celebration today. We have 500 representatives from 81 countries in the world. With almost equal number of men and women, and the furthest and the closest representative coming from Australia and Latvia at the same time, and it's Peter Greste and his parents, Juris and Louise. Peter, journalism is not a crime. I don't know if you are here, but journalism is not a crime. Ladies and gentlemen, all the repressive regimes in the past have required total control of our expression and conscience, and also today the freedom of expression, the freedom of media, and the safety of journalists are under a continuous threat in many places of the world. That is why this year's World Press Freedom Day and its theme is Let Journalism Thrive towards better reporting, gender equality, and media safety in the digital age. I would like to thank now for the collab collaboration, the great team from UNESCO, the steering committee members, volunteers and students of the youth newsroom members, all those who have greatly helped by volunteering to organize this event. I would also like to thank the sponsors and other supporters of this event. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again a warm welcome and let the conference begin. Thank you, Baiba. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If any of you need interpretation, you can take headbands at the end of the room. My name is Paul Srauceps. I'm a journalist here in Latvia, and I will be moderating this opening ceremony. May 3rd, World Press Freedom Day. As a Latvian journalist, it is a pleasure and honor that UNESCO has decided to celebrate this important date here in Riga in an event that is all at once symbolic and fitting. It's an event marked by symbolism because, as some of you may know, it happens that one day before Latvia celebrates its 25th anniversary of the declaration that launched Latvia on its course to renew the country's independence. And as we journalists know, and I think everybody in Latvia appreciates, one of the main benefits of that independence is the freedom of speech and freedom of media that it provides. But it's especially fitting that this ceremony should take place in this building, the Latvian National Library, which not only attests to the power of words and ideas, but also received very strong support from the very beginning from UNESCO. But without further ado, 
and I will launch into the program whose importance is marked by the fact that we have these distinguished leaders here to open the conference. And so, for the first welcoming remarks, I invite Irina Bokova, the Director General of UNESCO. Ms. Bokova. Excellencies um, Edgar Srinkevich, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Latvia. Excellencies uh, Dacia Melbarde, Minister of Culture of the Republic of Latvia. Ms. Mona Rush, uh, Rushmavi, United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Mr. David Kay, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, allow me to thank the Government of Latvia for co-hosting the 2015 World Press Freedom Day. I believe this reflects the strength of Latvia's commitment to promoting freedom of expression. And also, it embodies values with deep roots in the society and history of your country, which celebrates this, this year the 25th anniversary of the restoration of independence, for which we congratulate the people and the government of Latvia. I see this also embodying the Latvian presidency of the European Union. And uh, I would say uh, to once again to congratulate Latvia taking forward freedom of expression during this event and further on till the end of its presidency. Just two weeks ago, ladies and gentlemen, UNESCO held an exhibition on Aspas Aspasia and Rhinis, two celebrated Latvian poets, playwrights, political figures, and also journalists. This World Press Freedom Day takes place in a turning point year, when governments are shaping a new global sustainable development agenda. In these times of turbulence, freedom of expression has never been so important for the rule of law and democracy, for dialogue, for peace, and for sustainable development. 2015 is also a special year for UNESCO when we celebrate the organization's 70th anniversary. Written after a devastating war, our constitution says political agreements between states are not enough for lasting peace. This requires solidarity. It requires, and I quote from our Constitution, the free flow of ideas by word and image. This was true in 1945, and it remains so now. Opportunities for freedom of expression with new technologies are vast today. More and more people can access, produce, and share information. Developments in business models, technologies, are opening new avenues for freedom of expression. But at the same time, freedom of expression faces a horizon of challenges. The challenge of censorship, the challenge of weak pluralism, the challenge at worst of violence. The numbers are staggering. Over the last 10 years, 675 journalists have been killed. Only one out of 10 cases have been brought to justice. This year opened with a horrendous terrorist attack in France starting on 7th January, followed by the killing of a police officer on 8th January and the anti-Semitic attack on 9th January. Violent extremism seeks to divide women and men against each other to divide humanity as a whole. We see this underway in Iraq, in Syria, in a brutal campaign of cultural cleansing. This campaign is being propagated across the world using all media, especially social media, and targeting young minds. In response, we must be clear in our narrative. Human rights and dignity are our compass setting and the measure of, su of success for all our efforts. 
We must do everything to let journalism thrive, as this is the motto of this conference of this year's celebration, and also to ensure the safety of journalists, to promote the voices of all men and women. These issues, I know, were explored yesterday during the side event led by the Stock Stockholm School of Economics here in Riga. This is why, as the United Nations Agency mandated to protect freedom of expression and press freedom, I stand up every time a journalist is killed and call for justice. This is the inspiration for the United Nations Plan of Action for Safety of Journalists and the issue of impunity spearheaded by UNESCO. We are taking this forward across the world, working with governments, with professional associations, with educational institutions, with justice ministries, and with security forces. In Pakistan, we have supported the creation of a national coalition of local authorities to implement the United Nations plan. In Guatemala, we are bolstering mechanisms for the safety of journalists, which I discussed earlier this year with the Office of the President and the Special Prosecutor for Human Rights. This is a long haul work. To succeed, we must reach beyond usual constituencies, for instance, by training security forces on freedom of press in Tunisia, what we did already, through the massive open online courses that reached 1,000 judges and lawyers in Mexico. We must also make the case at the global level to place freedom of expression at the heart of the post-2015 development agenda. For peace to be lasting, for development to be sustainable, women and men must be free to create and share knowledge and information. We need quality journalism to allow citizens to make informed decisions about their society's development, to check injustice and the abuse of power. A free media is not a luxury that can wait until sustainable development can be achieved. It is a condition for human dignity, good governance, and the rule of law. This is why we need every voice to be heard, especially those of women. This message is very relevant this year, as we mark the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Conference and the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Women are still underrepresented in newsmaking, decision-making, media ownership. We need to redress the balance. We must join together to empower women in and through all media. This is the importance of the UNESCO Global Alliance on Media in Gender that we launched two years ago. We must also act online to promote freedom of expression in the global public cyberspace. People speak of a new generation of digital natives. I believe we need a new generation of digital citizens. This is why UNESCO works to advance media literacy, to promote new media as platforms for dialogue, to strengthen respect for human rights, especially with young people, to bolster new forms of global citizenship. I know this is a priority for Latvia, and I thank the government for its support to UNESCO. This is the spirit of the social media campaign we launched, we're leading with Google to celebrate World Press Freedom Day and the goal of UNESCO's Unite for Heritage campaign that I launched just a month ago in the University of Baghdad to respond to violent extremism with messages of dialogue and shared values. The same goals guide the International Conference on Youth and Internet, fighting radicalization and extremism to be held next month at UNESCO. The same spirit also inspires two studies we are launching today, building digital safety for journalism 
and the role of internet intermediaries. So, ladies and gentlemen, in times of change, we must remain true to the values we share and stand up for them everywhere they are challenged. This is the message sent by UNESCO member states two weeks ago in the powerful decision they adopted on the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity. This reason also inspired me to appoint a very prominent journalist from CNN and international correspondent, Christian Amanpour, to become a UNESCO goodwill ambassador for the safety of journalists. And I believe this is the message we send today on the World Press Freedom Day. And it is so inspiring to launch it and to hold this conference in the library of Riga, a library, a cultural home, a convention home, today, I think, a house of freedom of expression with which UNESCO has been associated for the last 10 years. We are very proud of this achievement. And allow me once again to thank the government of Latvia for this leadership and to thank all of the participants from more than 80 countries for coming with us today to celebrate, to discuss, and at the end of the day, let journalism thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bokova. Our next speaker, speaker is Edgar Srinkevich, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Latvia. He's been very busy with the presidency since January, but I'm sure this is one of the most important events of the year for him. Mr. Srinkevich. Director General, dear colleague, Minister of Culture, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to Latvia, a very warm welcome to Riga. It is my honor and pleasure to open the World Press Freedom Day events in Latvia. These days are of special importance for Latvia and also for me personally. 25 years <coughs> ago, on the 1st of May, Latvia regained independence after 50 long years of Soviet occupation. Remarkably, it was not our military force that destroyed the Soviet regime, but people's will. We wanted our freedom back. We wanted to live without fear of repression for thinking and expressing ourselves freely. Journalists, thinkers, and writers played a crucial role in this process. I would like to express my deep gratitude to all of you working in this very important and difficult profession. Let us also remember media professionals who have lost their lives and honor those who bring us information despite danger and risk. Ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations General Assembly at its very first session in 1946 adopted a resolution stating, freedom of information is a fundamental human right and the touchstone of all the freedoms to which the United Nations is consecrated. Thus, it is not only a fundamental human right, but also one that enables other rights to be protected and exercised. The guarantee of this freedom has particular significance for the media. As key means of communication, the ability of the media to function independently is vital to freedom of expression, but also to the ability of a society to function and survive. For independent and quality journalism to thrive, it has to take place in a relatively safe environment and with sustainable long-term financing. It has to be constantly nurtured and never taken for granted. Our ability to act as informed citizens of the world depends on media that can work freely and safely. More than 90% of all reported attacks against journalists, unfortunately, remain unresolved. Most journalists are killed in their own countries of origin. Impunity remains a key challenge. We must work to ensure that existing international standards for the protection of journalists are being implemented in practice. Female journalists are particularly vulnerable, especially those reporting in conflict zones, and this demands special attention. Furthermore, gender equality and women in media are themes of the conference that also goes hand in hand with Latvia's human rights priorities. These two topics are interlinked. On the one hand, gender equality in any society 
gives an equal chance to work in media or any other business. On the other hand, women in media are a significant facilitating factor in development of a just society. Ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to stress that critical thinking and information literacy are crucial in order to overcome propaganda and disinformation. Unfortunately, this phenomenon has become a serious security issue also in our part of the world. It is therefore vital that governments pursue policies that support high-quality investigative journalism and protect editorial independence. Guaranteeing freedom of expression, both offline and online, and strengthening the independence of quality media are among priorities of Latvia. We promote it as a part of our presidency of the Council of the European Union and in international organizations, including at the United Nations, where Latvia is a member of the Human Rights Council for the first time. Latvia is actively involved in the cross-regional initiative called the Freedom Online Coalition, and we strongly support the Digital Defenders Partnership, which provides practical assistance to those who need it the most, journalists, bloggers, media organizations, and human rights defenders who find themselves under attack. We also welcome UNESCO international programs for the development of communication, extensive range of projects worldwide, and we will make a voluntary contribution to that program. In conclusion, I would like to express my strong and sincere hope that our common efforts, including the conference today, will contribute to media freedom in the world and will ensure that no journalist in the 21st century, offline or online, is being sealed from the rest of the world through a new iron curtain. Free press is a backbone of sustainable democracy and development. It enables competition of ideas, enhances creativity and prosperity. Let the free press thrive. I wish insightful and dynamic discussions in the course of this conference, and I thank you for the attention. Thank you, Mr. Renkevich. Our next speaker is Datsa Malbarde, the Minister of Culture of the Republic of Latvia, but who also has a very strong background in UNESCO uh, and is at present the president of the Latvian UNESCO Commission. Please, Ms. Malbarde. Good morning, Honorable Director General of UNESCO, Madame Bokova, dear colleague, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. At this very moment here in the conference, we are just some hundred meters away from the place where people manifested their desire from freedom of expression. 25 years ago, Latvia declared its independence from the Soviet Union. However, there was still a long road ahead to fill independence and freedom. In 1991, more than a half of a million people came out to protest against the Soviet special forces that were attacking Lithuanian institutions. Barricades were built in defense of the parliament and around important buildings, including those of the public broadcasters and their editorial offices. People gathered in the freezing Baltic winter to defend our freedom and to fight against attempts to restore the totalitarian Soviet regime. During these decisive days, Latvia lost its brave cameraman, Andris Slapinch, who was killed by a sniper fired by Soviet forces while he was filming a follow-up story on the barricades. His fellow cameraman, Guido Zweigsne, was also shot and later died of his injuries. And the leader of the crew, film director Juris Podniks, received a severe beating. This unselfish work of Podniks' crew symbolizes the hard and stony path to Latvia's independence. Their sacrifice undoubtedly uh, accelerated the renewal of our freedom. Unfortunately, as uh, Ms. Bokova and Mr. Rinkevich already mentioned, the safety of journalists all over the world continues to be under threat. The arrest in Cairo in 2013 of the Latvian-Australian journalist Peter Greste reminds us of how fragile the freedom of expression is. Not that long ago, in 1998, 
the Russian journalist Galina Vasilyevna Starovoytova was gunned down in the entrance of her apartment building in St. Petersburg. In 2006, Anna Politkovskaya was found dead in the elevator of her apartment house in the central Moscow. These are only few of the many journalists whose lives are affected or were taken for political reasons to stop their journalistic investigations on topics uncomfortable for politicians. Journalists risk their lives every day. The desire for freedom of expression was a major impulse to destroy the totalitarian regime in Latvia. We are grateful to international society that joined forces with us and supported us over the years on this tough and complicated road to freedom. For example, the Swedish publisher Expressen produced press in the Latvian language and provided uncensored and trustworthy information to our people during the barricades. The importance of this support cannot be overestimated. The solidarity of people, communities, nations, countries and international networks is a key factor in the fight for freedom of expression, opinion, speech and thinking to this day. We Latvians have experienced the great power of solidarity many times in our history. Let me mention here the Latvian nationwide song and dance celebration, a 150 years old tradition that is recognized by UNESCO as a masterpiece of oral and intangible cultural heritage of humanity. At the end of the 19th century, the song celebration provided the framework for the formation of the Latvian national identity when through singing thousands of people found and expressed new self-confidence as a nation. In 1918, this self-confidence led to the proclamation of the independent state of Latvia. A century later, this community singing tradition once again grew into a movement for political self-determination aimed at the restoration of independence. In the world history, this movement is known as the singing revolution of the Baltic countries. Singing has been a legal form of uh, artistic expression even at times when such expression was strictly forbidden or limited. For that reason, many Latvian songs, some of them always performed at the song and dance celebration, contain hidden messages about national identity, the nation's freedom and the desire for liberty. The most performed song metaphorically illustrates our nation's burning desire for freedom as a castle of light rising up from the darkness. We experience uh, a strong international solidarity very recently when on the initiative of the Latvian presidency, the ministers of culture of the European Union adopted a joint statement after the unspeakable act of terror at the office of Charlie Hebdo. The statement clearly confirmed that the freedom of think, freedom to think, speak and to create are universal democratic values. We all agreed that freedom of expression stands firm and unflinching at the heart of our common values. Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow we celebrate the day when the Declaration of Renewed Independence was adopted 20 years ago. And no, we enjoy all the benefits of its independence. However, together with rapid technological development and the unexpected avalanche of information it brought, we experience that our democracy and values must be cherished and maintained with the greater care. These years clearly demonstrate that the freedom of expression is also a great responsibility. I refer here to responsibility that concerns everyone, politicians, institutions, media, society, each one of us, where particularly the responsibility of the media itself plays a crucial role. The freedom of expression is closely related to the inner freedom of a human being and our own responsibility is that we are ready to take, to protect and to benefit of this great value. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Malbarde. Unfortunately, Flavia Pansieri, the Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights, was not able to attend today, but her remarks, her special remarks, will be read by Mona Rishmawi, the Chief of the Rule of Law and Non-Discrimination Branch Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Please, Ms. Rishmawi. Thank you very much, His Excellency Foreign Minister, Her Excellency Minister of Culture, Her Excellency Madam Director General, Mr. Special Rapporteur, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to have the opportunity for our office to be here with you today, with journalists from across the world, and all of you who work to support freedom of expression or opinion. Every state in the world needs journalism sound, bold, and independent. States that repress, attack, or fail to protect journalism are targeting their own lifeblood, the fluid element that keeps fresh ideas and healthy questions circulating around the system, which builds in responsiveness, res resilience, and accountability in the machinery of government. This, in turn, brings public confidence and legitimacy. That is, of immense, that is the immense power of journalism. And yet, journalism is also fragile. We know that journalists are silenced, jailed, or even killed just because they are doing their jobs. In some states, government officials or security forces harass, threaten, or mistreat journalists, or lock them up on Trump charges. On others, they are assaulted by non-state actors terrorist and, uh, and violent extremist movements, criminal gangs, or angry mobs. Women journalists have been the target of sexual violence and distinctly gendered threats, sometimes, for most, uh, for, sometimes of the most vicious nature. Let me quickly outline four challenges. The first is the digital age, which crea creates a, a wealth of opportunities for the dissemination of information and and opinions, and at the same time, opens up new risks. Digital surveillance by governments may have a powerful chilling effect on journalists' freedom of expression, as it makes it more difficult for them to communicate with sources, share and develop ideas, and may lead to self-censorship, which is the worst. In some countries, people identified as dissidents sometimes with information ob obtained through digital surveillance, may be arrested, tortured, or, 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 and otherwise abused. From a human rights point of view, insofar they are enabled journal journalists' freedom of expression, anonymity, and encryption deserve protection and should not be unreasonably restricted. The second issue is the, with the emergence of new media, challenges are sometimes raised with regard who is a journalist. From a human rights perspective, this should not matter. All individuals are entitled to full protection of their human rights, whether the, uh, whether the state recognizes them as, their, as journalists or not, whether they are professional reporters or citizens journalists, online or offline. So yes, bloggers and citizens journalists should be protected too, and they have the freedom of expression. Third, uh, there is all too often, as we heard, complete impunity for crimes committed against journalists and bloggers. Even murders of journalists all too often, of, uh, murders of journalists all too often escape justice. Existing norms and standards must be enforced. We have been pleased to work with our partners with UNESCO and others in the development and implementation of the UN Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists, which you heard from the Director General, and the issue of impunity. I urge you all to rally behind this Plan of Action. To combat impunity, we know that specific measures need to be created, and we know that some of them work the creation of special investigative unit, specialized training and methodological tools for law enforcement officials and judicial officers, and close cooperation with regional accountabilities, uh, accountability mechanisms are just few examples. My fourth point is about gender equality. 
The media can be a key player in supporting the realization of women's human rights. The increased media attention to horrific stories of sexual violence in conflict situations increases awareness and contributes to preventing such violence in, in the future. But too many violations on women's and, uh, and girls' rights remain underreported. It is high time for women's journalists to be given the same opportunities and consideration as men. And it is high time for women to receive the same coverage as men in the, by the media. The deadline for this is now. I wish you a, a productive meeting and I look forward to your discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rishmavi. And now, a statement by David Kay, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the promotion of the right of freedom of opinion and expression, a position he assumed in August of 2014. Mr. Kay is clinical professor of law at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. Please, Mr. Kay. Thank you. Excellencies, ministers, Madam Director General, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin by thanking UNESCO and the government of Latvia and all the sponsors of World Press Freedom Day for making this day such a central focus for freedom of expression worldwide. Since I took on responsibility as Special Rapporteur last August, UNESCO in particular has been a welcome partner and counselor. For over 20 years, the international community has celebrated, advocated, and defended press freedom in the context of World Press Freedom Day. For nearly 40 years, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights has been in force, guaranteeing everyone under Article 19 the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of borders and through any kind of media. For nearly 70 years, that same guarantee has been the global standard under Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And during these many decades, the rights that guarantee a free press have been restated in instruments and courts at the regional and national levels, UN declarations, and resolutions of the Human Rights Council. All of this law, what does it mean? First, it protects everyone, as my colleague just mentioned. The professional journalist gathering and reporting information, the blogger and social media poster, sharing information and opinions with the world, and everyone who enjoys or seeks access to others' expression. Second, the law protects the activities of a free press to challenge or verify official narratives and conventional opinion by seeking and gathering information, analyzing and interpreting it, sharing it through any media regardless of frontiers. States also have a positive obligation to promote a free press, which includes ensuring a diversity of media. Other basic rules of human rights law, such as the prohibition of discrimination, obligate states to promote and protect the equal access and participation in the media of women and members of other vulnerable groups. States, of course, may impose restrictions on the freedom of expression, but only where provided by clear and pre-existing law and when strictly necessary and proportionate to a legitimate objective such as national security, public order and health, and the rights of others. However, particularly noxious to freedom of expression is the web of government secrecy employed by nearly all countries that makes it nearly impossible for citizens to challenge restrictions. Of course, I'm summarizing and simplifying a rich body of law. I look around this room and I see the leading practitioners of press freedom. Those of you who know how to make the law's protections real for people around the world. Your work of protection and promotion matters as much as the practice of journalism itself. But here's the thing. Everyone in this room or listening outside knows we are in a crisis of implementation, promotion, and protection. And in crisis, we may be forgiven for considering the thought that these laws mean little in the face of the attacks on free expression that have increased in recent years. 
We here in Riga stand secure while many journalists around the world are in detention, missing, buried, or deterred from exercising their rights. You may be recalling to mind any number of names of those detained or charged who represent often dozens of others in other countries. And because they represent so many others, I hesitate to name a few, but nonetheless I will, such as Mazen Darwish in Syria, Jason Rezian in Iran, the Zone 9 bloggers in Ethiopia, Ilam Toti in China, Khadija Ismailova in Azerbaijan, Tulani Maseko in Swaziland, Mahmoud Abu Zaid or Shao Khan in Egypt, Zunar in Malaysia, and many others in Eritrea, Vietnam, Myanmar, and elsewhere. And there are those killed, such as the satirists of Charlie Hebdo, the brave journalists killed by the Islamic State, and the recent brutal hackings of two Bangladeshi bloggers. You may also be thinking of the military leader of Thailand who recently claimed, quote, the power to close down the media, arrest people, order for people to be shot, end quote. Or the attacks on and intimidation of journalists by local police in Ferguson, Missouri. Or even the recent adoption of laws in Europe to restrict expression, including a new law in Spain that purports to ban video recording police at protests. Or the widespread pressure on journalistic sources. These attacks on a free press violate the letter and spirit of the freedom of expression. To clamp down on unwanted expression or seal off information from the public, those in power often deploy pretexts instead of legitimate justifications genuinely rooted in the protection of national security or public order. Or in the pursuit of legitimate objectives, they adopt disproportionate rules that sweep in or deter a wide range of legitimate expression, often in hurried and anxious reaction to real threats, undermining also the work of NGOs and others. What can we do to respond to these challenges? Tomorrow morning, my colleagues from the OSCE, Inter-American, and African Systems and I will jointly declare our commitment to promotion and protection of freedom of opinion and expression in context of conflict. I want to emphasize five areas briefly where we should all challenge governments to meet their obligations and in the theme of this meeting, let journalism thrive. First, online surveillance poses a direct threat to the media, NGOs, academics, and activists. Technology has responded with tools to protect the privacy of our communications, the two most of, important of which are encryption and anonymity. Ongoing debates over encryption and anonymity all too often focus on their potential use for criminal purposes. But encryption and anonymity mainly exist to empower individuals to browse, read, develop, and share opinions and information without interference. And they enable journalists civil society organizations, and many others to exercise their rights. A number of states are adopting laws which seriously limit the capacity of individuals to communicate securely and anonymously. Because of their importance, restrictions on encryption and anonymity must be avoided and only limited, if at all, according to strict application of the principles of legality, necessity, proportionality, and legitimacy. Second, protection of sources. Journalism relies on access to sources who feel sufficiently safe to share information, experiences, and testimony on sensitive matters. Yet in many countries, journalists suffer reprisals for their investigative work, forced to reveal their sources, who in turn are also harassed, attacked, and often prosecuted. Third, accountability for attacks on the media. Attacks on journalists are sadly almost never met with genuine investigation and prosecution. Even in those cases where there is some form of investigation, victims and survivors must wait years for any sort of reckoning. This paradigm of impunity has to stop and be replaced with a paradigm of monitoring, investigation, and prosecution. Fourth, an end to laws designed to deter criticism of government officials and religious institutions. We see such laws in the form of criminal defamation, sedition, 
les majeste laws and their cousins prohibiting insults of government officials. We see the same spirit in laws that criminalize or prohibit blasphemy. These laws are regularly applied to target those working in the media, civil society activists, academics, and others. They are incompatible with freedom of expression and a free press, and they must be abolished. Finally, all of these measures connect to state censorship. Whether applied as prior censorship, as in the case of film and news censors, or as punishment after the fact, the efforts of governments to suppress information and ideas ultimately succeed only to breed cynicism and resentment, undermining every people's right to govern themselves freely and with full information for public debate. Censorship is, in a very real way, the underlying policy that fosters insecurity for journalists everywhere. So I do not want to close on such down notes. For all the threat and risk to the media today, we also live in an age of inspiring journalistic bravery, long and short form brilliance, and a world awash for the good in information, a multiplicity of media platforms, ideas, images, sounds, all of which cross borders and inform global debate. Daily, we see remarkable individuals and enterprises struggle against the current in the most difficult environments and succeed in informing us on matters which so many powerful states and groups try to hide. Journalism thrives where there is safety, equality, and fine reporting, and I'm happy to be a part of this joint effort to tear down the barriers to these critical goals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kay. And now, in conclusion, something special, which may seem a little lighthearted, but in fact, I think has a deep symbolic meaning in terms of representing the ability to freely disseminate information. For the first time since 1993, when the UN proclaimed May 3rd World Press Freedom Day, a country has put out a stamp in honor of this important day, and that country is Latvia. And therefore, I'd like to invite Arnes Salnais, the chairman of the board of Latvia's Posts, the Latvian Postal Service, to present this special stamp to the Director General of UNESCO, Ms. Irina Bokova. Ms. Bokova, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the Latvian Postal Service, uh, Latvia's Post, has issued a postage stamp on the occasion of uh, World Press Freedom Day and we are honored to participate at such an important event and hope that our postage stamp will uh, serve as a Latvian business card and reaching countries where mass media, both printed and online, are still fighting for the right to be heard. And with a postage stamp on an envelope, we keep in mind that our values and our humanity can be incorporated into letters where the recipient feels a connection with the sender in a way that an email or tweet cannot quite match. And I uh, would like to present to you this stamp as a memory from today and this special event. And I please, please write some letters and send some postcards whenever you travel from place to place. <laughs> this is for you. And I would like to give such, an, such a stamp also to all speakers as a memory from today. <laughs> <laughs>